So I would like to introduce you Cedric Villani. Uh, he is uh, very well known for every, everyone here. But uh, I would like to say a few words. Uh, he uh, did a very relevant work in uh, uh, synthetic behavior for uh, the partial differential equations, particularly in kinetic equations, talking about the Boltzmann equation, essentially for the uh, synthetic behavior of the Boltzmann equation. Also, about uh, he did an excellent work in understanding some irreversible uh, 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 dynamics inside a reversible system, like the Blasso Poisson equation and the Landau damping. And he also did, uh, he had time to write a couple of books about optimal transport theory, in which he uh, did very relevant contributions to. And some of the things that he's going to uh, discuss in his talk are going to be related to that, I think, and the relation to geometry. And uh, of course, all of you know that uh, he got uh, the Fields Medal in, uh, at the ICM in 2010. And he even uh, had the time to write a book for the uh, general audience about uh, some kind of autobiography book in French, still only in French, I believe. Or uh, no, no, Italian, German. Uh, already, they are Korean, translated. Okay, so you English, translated Soviet, already. So you will have um, opportunity at some yes, point, Spanish. not the Spanish yet. Okay, not Catalan either. Cata uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it, uh, it's going to be uh, well, a pleasure to share with him uh, this talk. And finally, I would like to answer already one question that some of you may have. I met uh, Cedric 18 years ago for the first time in Toulouse, and yes, he already wore like this. Okay, <laughs> okay so please, go ahead. Thank you, Jose Antonio. Okay. Is there a, a portable microphone, by the way? No, it would be more convenient for me. If not, I'll go with this. Okay, we're going to try. We're gonna try. Okay, let's start like this anyway. Thanks a lot, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, in Barcelona. Always a pleasure to be back here. And uh, also a pleasure to do things with Jose Antonio Carrillo, who has been, as he mentioned, uh, my friend for a long time now. Today's talk is uh, going to be intended for general, rather general audience, although from time to time there will be uh, some slides with a bit more advanced content. And uh, it will be about discovering, about explaining some progress in mathematics in which I was involved. <coughs> ah, no, 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 I don't like this one either. I prefer this, thank you. <laughs> yes, let's go, let's, so let's, let's keep with this, let's keep with this. I like, you know, the good old-fashioned microphones, like the singers and so on. This thing, the problem is that you have to remain like this, and I'm a kind of jumpy guy, but the other thing is the problem is that if you start uh, moving your hair or your head too much like this, oh, okay. So, Let's uh, go for today's talk. Yes, it would be good to have the picture. Who is in charge? <laughs> there is somebody in charge. <laughs> Let's go, 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 go. <laughs> ah, beautiful. Now we have a good microphone. Perfect. Beautiful. Okay. This is today's program. A lot of things to talk about. The most important being the last ingredient, in a sense, insisting on the human side of our field, that we are all of us aware, but it's good to recall it as soon as possible. And uh, in this talk, we'll see a meeting between fields and directions of research, which corresponds to meeting of people and researchers. Let us recall about the nature of mathematics. I like to use this slide for broad audience talks, people who are scientists but not mathematicians maybe, or people who are not scientists and so on. And uh, recalling that mathematician is like 
The Lady of Shalott. This is the illustration of that famous poem from Alfred Lord Tennyson, The Lady of Shalott. You know she has been struck by some uh, curse, and so her fate is to look at the world only through the reflection in the mirror. And uh, because he left no indication if there was some meaning, you know, you are entitled to think what you want. So I like to think this is allegory of the mathematician, looking at the reality only through the mirror of the abstract symbols and equations. And uh, it's a very powerful way of doing things. When you are a mathematician, you work only on equations, but you prove things which can be embodied by many, many experiments in the world. One of the most famous, if not the most famous, maybe, being the Gaussian law, which is something you prove in a few lines, and uh, something which uh, you can check in many different experiments, looking at variations of levels of ocean, of size of individuals, of errors in the pores, etc. Or you can think of this. So in the tale of Lady of Shalott, uh, you know, this is Lancelot coming, and when, when he passes by, he's so handsome that she has to see him directly. So the curse uh, strikes her, and she dies, and her body goes in the water, and so on. It's very tragic. And she goes through the river, and river for a long time. All we could do to study it was just watch or do paintings, or do a little bit of recordings. And then one day arrived Euler and the mathematicians from 18th century, and then the people in numerical analysis and so on. And nowadays, equations from fluid mechanics, we use them every day to predict things in a very, very sharp way, to reproduce it even better than the reality, in a sense. People now know that to understand something about fluids, Computer experiments are much better than real experiments, in some sense. It's something that strikes people who are non-mathematicians when you explain them that there are open problems in mathematics. This is something non-researchers are very surprised of. And uh, if, you, if they ask what is the most famous, for sure it will be Riemann hypothesis. Riemann hypothesis, if you think about it, shows very much the particular nature of mathematics. It is statement about objects which are very familiar, like prime numbers and their statistics, but it's made in connection with something that is completely abstract, a certain function, where are the zeros? Do these zeros in the complex plane line together, line up together? And this conjecture has been checked on billions and billions of examples. In any science, if a certain theory is checked billions of times, you admit it as a truth, but not in mathematics. You need a proof showing that it will be true for any zero you will ever encounter. This is scientific skepticism pushed to the most possible. Riemann hypothesis is something that uh, makes people dream and fantasize. Here is a title from a few years ago, about 10 years ago in The Guardian. Math, holy grail, could bring disaster from internet. Of course, uh, one immediately understands that the poor journalist has understood nothing. Riemann hypothesis tells us that uh, prime numbers are distributed randomly, kind of. How on earth could this help finding prime numbers? One can just wonder. But we don't need this to be fascinated by the problem because it touches some very simple and fascinating objects. As Andrew Wiles once joked, uh, most mathematicians would gladly give a million dollars to prove the conjecture. <laughs> Riemann did not give us only the conjecture. He advanced all kinds of mathematics. In particular, he gave us modern geometry. After Euclid, what do we do? 
well, for a long time there were examples of geometry treating this or that particular geometry and then Riemann gave us the axioms that allow to consider any curved geometry in a way. Geometry in which units of length and angles may change at each location. There, of course, we cannot still have straight lines, but instead we have the geodesics, shortest path. And of course, they are curved. And uh, you could stay there and write the equations for the geodesics and write many examples of geometries and so on, accumulating facts and facts and facts. But mathematics is not about facts, nor is science in general. A very good quote of Henri Poincaré says, science is made of facts, like houses are made of stones. But science is no more an accumulation of facts than a house is an accumulation of stones. You need to construct, you need to order. That is science, find ordering principles. And Riemann gave us the ordering principle that to this day has remained the basic principle for understanding curved geometry, the Riemann curvature. A notion which tells you, if, uh, to, tells you how to compare the geometry to the flat geometry. If geodesics get closer than they should be in Euclidean space, then the curvature is positive. And geodesic triangles will look fat, like this one. You see the sum of angles, of course, here is more than 180 degrees. If, on the contrary, geodesics tend to separate faster than should be, then this is negative curvature, and triangles are skinny. And here, with this concept, we can classify many aspects of many geometries that exist and that will exist. Curvature makes beautiful shapes. See here, examples of negative curvature. Constant negative curvature bodies, surfaces, coming from some problems in uh, mathematical physics. Here you have these beautiful hyperbolic coral reefs that you can find in a museum in Dublin. And uh, here, look at this pseudosphere, so elegant that it was part for some time of an exhibition in Paris in the uh, gallery of contemporary art called Mathematics, beautiful elsewhere. Of course, this is kind of things they like in Paris. And uh, you see, in these, with these shapes, we can see connection between mathematics and art that we are very well used to. But we also know that mathematics is damn useful and powerful and efficient. And later, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, Richie Corbastro worked again on the work on Riemann, built on it, developed this concept of curvature. It turned out that this was exactly what Einstein needed for his theory of general relativity. And uh, then it was no longer a mathematics problem, but a problem of uh, physics. And then it became a problem of technology when the problem came of incorporating general relativity corrections into our GPS. Nowadays, we have a little bit of uh, Einstein and Riemann in our GPS, in many of our cars. And, uh, and we see here an example in which technology arises from some development, some pure development driven first by curiosity. And uh, in the end, coming into a little bit of Riemann, Ricci and Einstein in our device. You can check by looking inside. Riemann worked on many problems of uh, mathematical physics too, and he was one of the first to try to describe singularities. Prism, for instance, in fluids, when you have supersonic planes or supersonic bullets. Riemann is remarkable, in fact, for his way of looking at everything and being an and interested in everything. This is something a bit frightening. A list of topics named after Bernard Riemann from Wikipedia, it's crazy when you compare it to the lifespan. 
He was uh, dead essentially at my age. Wow, this is really frightening. This makes uh, Riemann reiteration some romantic figure able to to capture many many things. I actually once uh, encountered. I met a famous rock singer who told me that from time to time, to get inspiration, she goes to the Riemann grave. <laughs> this is again artist being inspired by mathematicians. Good to know. I recommend graves. This <laughs> is picture of me looking inspiration, looking for inspiration on the grave of Ludwig Boltzmann, one of my heroes. Boltzmann died in 1906. Well, he committed suicide. He was a guy with some problems, but with a beautiful, that gave us some beautiful discoveries. Here is the, one of the formulas that made him famous. S is K log W. Formula for the entropy. At the time of Boltzmann, Boltzmann and Maxwell were the heroes of a scientific revolution from the 1860s, 1870s, which was a revolution of statistical physics. The idea that many complicated physical phenomena could be explained from the fact that there are behind a very, very many of simple particles and interactions. And for instance, they tried to model a gas as just a collection of balls, like in a billiard, but really many, many balls, like billions of billions. Obeying the laws of Newton, maybe, so some very simple microscopic laws, but the resulting microscopic laws can be complicated. Together with uh, Maxwell, as I said, they developed the formalism, the kinetic formalism that Jose Antonio was alluding to, in which you describe a gas not by looking at all the velocities of the particles, but at the statistical distribution of velocities. You get a curve. What can you say about the evolution of this curve? This was putting, getting, taking place inside an important trend in sciences, which started about 1700 the slow mastering of chance. By definition, chance, randomness, is something you cannot predict. And it was a big conceptual progress when people understood that you could give some predictions about chance, in particular when you make many experiments and when they are independent. Bernoulli asked about the problem of large numbers. You toss a coin, you look at the proportions between head and tails, what will be the proportion limit as time goes and you make many, many throws? <coughs> De Moivre, about 1730, discovered that Gaussian law, Gaussian law, something that is very universal and at the same time very practical, both very abstract and very concrete. Incidentally, De Moivre can be claimed by both the French and the English because uh, he was a Huguenot, so sought a refuge in uh, English during the time of the relig war, re religion wars. So it goes very well with this, the destiny of this thing, both very abstract and very concrete. Let's go, uh, and uh, what the, the idea being that this law, this Gaussian profile, is a universal profile. When you make many, many throws, you see how it will be distributed. After some rescaling, it will occur, this Gaussian curve. Later, with uh, Buffon, arrives the uh, marriage of probability with geometry. Take a needle, and uh, here, you know, some lines, with the separation between lines being the same as uh, the length of the needle and throw the needle many, many times, like millions of times, and look and compute what is the proportion of times that the needle 
will cross one of the lines. It will approach 2 over pi. First, there is something remarkable in this. You throw it in a number of ways, in pure random way, and in the end you can predict with almost certainty what will be the probability. And uh, of course, the presence of pi here is related to the geometric nature of the problem. It is only in 1810 that Laplace proves the law of errors. If you take a random sample and you look at the deviation from the mean, and all the samples, all the random variables being independent, and you take the average and you compare this with the mean of the distribution, you will have fluctuations around that mean whose amplitude is like the inverse of the square root of, the, of n the times the number of times that you make the experiment, and the shape will be Gaussian. This is one of the most striking theorems of all mathematics. And uh, it appeared a few decades later that with uh, works by people like Kitterly of or Galton, that uh, this was not just mathematician problem or geometric problem, but uh, that you can also find it in social sciences, in uh, experiments, in uh, biological beings, like Galton was looking at fluctuations of size of animals, or Kitterly was looking at fluctuations of the number of crimes committed in the city from year to year and so on. And all these are subject uh, with the rather good precision to Gaussian fluctuation. There is something amazing in this. Galton says it in a beautiful way. I know of scarcely anything so apt to impress the imagination as the wonderful form of cosmic order expressed by the law of frequency of error. The law would have been personified by the Greeks and deified if they had known of it. It reigns with serenity and incomplete self-effacement amidst the wildest confusion. The huger the mob and the greater the apparent anarchy, the more perfect is its sway. It is the supreme law of unreason. Whenever a large sample of chaotic elements are taken in hand and marshaled in the order of their magnitude, an unsuspected and most beautiful form of regularity proves to have been latent all along. And this brings us back to Boltzmann. Boltzmann was trying to find the laws, the predictions that you can make in a gas which is mostly governed by randomness, by chaotic collisions, in a way that you can apparently not predict because there is no way you can see where the collisions will appear, but in a way that maybe can be predicted statistically. Boltzmann, this is young Boltzmann, Boltzmann discovered this formula, S is K log W. You have a system, a gas, and you make statistical experiments to try to understand the gas. And uh, ask to find like, what is the velocity profile and so on. And then you ask, what is the uncertainty that still remains in the gas? Because I don't have access to the positions of velocity, so maybe there are a lot of unknowns behind. All the unknowns you put in this W, which is like the number of configurations or the volume of configurations. Take the logarithm and this uncertainty you call the entropy. It measures how disordered the gas is. Disordered meaning that you cannot predict what is the state of one particle from measurements on the whole. This formula has some uh, magic in it, like E is MC square and so on. Actually, here is a story of this picture. Once, I was, so this picture was taken in Central Cemetery in Vienna. I recommend it. Beautiful place, but it's huge cemetery. I knew that Boltzmann was buried there, and I was there, but uh, arrived in the, in the evening, nobody at the entrance, no plan. Where to find Boltzmann? This was a puzzle. But there, there was a family uh, sitting on a bench and I asked them if there is a way I can find a map of the cemetery. And they told me, no, no map. Who are you looking for? 
And I said, Bosman, saying, maybe they heard about him, who knows? And the guy looked at me and exactly answered this, S is K log W. <laughs> and then, you know, Mr. like it is the password for the sect or something. And he took me to the grave and took the picture. S is K log W, maybe a secret formula or something. It may be very important, but still it is a theoretical concept here. If there is your friend who is an engineer, makes a measurement of the gas, and then he asks what is the entropy, and you tell him, well, it's K log W, say, okay, but what is W, how do I compute this? So Boltzmann, to solve this kind of cases, also found a formula which relates the distribution F to the entropy. Minus integral of F log F. This is what becomes of S is K log W if you take into account only the distribution F. Now this becomes practical. And Boltzmann proved using an equation that this entropy can only increase with time. This again is a concept which orders things and which explains. Like the curvature of Riemann it gives you a way to understand what the gas wants to do. Take, for instance, a gas which is in half of a box. And at the beginning of the experiment, you remove the wall between this half and that half. What will the gas do? Of course, it will invade the whole gas. Informally, we like to think that the void vacuum aspires the gas, sucks the gas in. But Boltzmann tells us it's not about force, about sucking. It's just about the fact that the gas wants to maximize the disorder. Like turbulent children in a school, they want to get into the configuration that is most unpredictable. <laughs> and of course, if they invade the whole of the box, it's much more uncertain than if they are just on one side of the box. For each particle, this is twice as big. If there are many, many, many particles, this will be two to a power of many, many, many. An enormous number. In his proof, Boltzmann was using one of the key technologies of mankind nowadays. Partial differential equations. You see, Boltzmann had this formula for the entropy, but then how does this evolve in time? It depends on the evolution of F. So how does F evolve in time? And this was the answer, Boltzmann equation. Boltzmann equation, maybe most of you cannot appreciate how sexy it is, but it's really a beautiful equation. I, it takes some time to get used to it. I remember when I was, not, I was undergraduate and discussing with my future advisor about what to do, and he writes the equation. It's the first time I see it, and he tells me, you know, we're gonna do this and this, and if you master it well, in a couple of years, we can go on to this question, and I thought, my goodness, am I going to spend two years with this thing? <laughs> Maybe it's time to change the plan, you know? <laughs> but then, I, started going to it and so on, and I fell in love with the equation, really. I spent 10 years with this equation. <laughs> it's like everything. You think it's so damn specialized, and when you enter it, it's a whole world coming to life under your eyes with uh, problems related to very fundamental theoretical physics problems, but also very practical applications and related to many beautiful techniques and problems in, uh, in analysis, in mathematics. This models a rarefied gas, a gas in which there is uh, not so much density so that the main effect driving the gas is collisions between just two particles. If you're interested in stars in a galaxy, it is not a good model because stars don't collide but stars feel the influence of each other over very long distances. So instead you will use this kind of model called Vlasov-Poisson, the number one tool for predicting the evolution of a galaxy which can be made of hundreds of billions of stars. If you are uh, 
this uh, equation is uh, an important equation for geometers, the Ricci flow. It is used if you want to kind of spread the curvature of Riemann on a surface or on a multidimensional surface, a manifold. You want to spread the curvature in a way that is most diffuse if possible. This is the equation that you use. If you're interested in the behavior of atoms, this is the Schrodinger equation that will describe it. One atom of hydrogen, for instance. Now here we have the reaction diffusion equations used by Turing to try to describe pattern formation. Here we have the equation of fluid mechanics which are used every day to try to predict the weather in big uh, meteorological weather cast uh, centers and so on. So all of these things were at the same time victories over the unknown and uh, technological tools for mankind. What can we study after Boltzmann? What can a mathematician do in this business? For instance, as Rosie Antonio mentioned, I worked a lot on the asymptotic behavior of gas. We know that entropy goes up, okay, but going up is very vague. Does it go up fast or slow? Does it go up like this or like this or like this? So many possibilities. How does it depend on the box? How does it depend on the interactions? So many questions that you can ask. This is the formula for the increase of entropy, the instantaneous increase of entropy. It may look a bit ugly. There is this logarithm. You have something like A minus B times log A over B, which is obviously not negative because logarithm is an increasing function. Because the entropy goes up, we can hope, we can expect that the distribution will look for a state of maximum entropy. Then it's a bit of exercise. Look for distribution with maximum entropy. What do you find? Ha! Huh? The Gaussian curve, again. And there's a deep reason for that. In fact, you can revisit the results of Laplace by using the fact that the entropy goes up when you uh, take averages of uh, random variables. See here, how we are connecting a problem of physics and the problems of probability. Here is a problem, for instance, one of my first good results, I think, from, the, uh, from 1907-98, was a work on the so-called Cercignani conjecture. This was Carlo Cercignani. He passed away a few years ago. He was one of the specialists of Boltzmann equation. He wrote some of the reference textbooks. His book on Boltzmann equation was the first research book that I ever read. And uh, one of his, his conjecture was the following. Look at this entropy production, which tells you about the rate of increase of entropy. Try to compare it to the difference of entropies between the Gaussian curve and the function itself. Can you find a bound like this? Which would mean that if you are far, if the distribution is far from the Gaussian, then the entropy goes fast. Of course, if you have something like this, it would be a first step in showing that the convergence to equilibrium is fast. This was the kind of problem that I was working on, in particular with Italian collaborator Giuseppe Toscani first. And we proved that this conjecture in general is false, but sometimes it's true, it depends on the interaction between particles. And uh, many, there are many works like this also related to information theory. It was a big thing for us. Boltzmann, as I said, died in 1906, but his uh, ideas lived on. And had a lot of influence on Einstein and Smulchowski to explain Brownian motion and the atomistic nature of matter uh, to till the day where Perra convinced everybody that atoms were a reality. Mark Katz, one of the greatest probabilists, uh, wrote that uh, the book of Boltzmann is one of the greatest books ever written in exact sciences. Shannon discovered that the formula of Boltzmann is very important in information theory to understand about transmission of messages. Now we use it every day in communications and so on. But also it is used in the industry, like in cars, when you want to understand, make models about the behavior of a gas in a motor and so on, and we know to optimize some shapes. Here also, like in the Riemann case, we see how an invention with that the first is a problem of very fundamental theoretical physics one day becomes with has applications in our cars. 
Entropy, as many mathematical discoveries, in fact has applications both ways. Applications to very concrete things, but also can be used as application to abstract things and enrich mathematics from the physics. And entropy, after it had been revisited by Boltzmann, became an important tool for pure, so to speak, mathematics, showing well the unity of mathematics. It is fundamental in compressible food mechanics where, for instance, entropy behavior is used to select physically relevant solutions in uh, hyperbolic systems of conservation laws. It is, uh, I mentioned about the relation to Shannon, a relation with the central mid theorem. But also think of this, for instance, one of the most celebrated results of John Nash, the regularity of non-smooth diffusion equations. Take a heat equation in a mixture of metals, which is completely random, so that the conductivity can jump arbitrarily from place to place. Start with a discontinuous distribution of temperature. Will it become continuous or not? So in the 50s, it was solved independently by Nash and by the Georgi, and this was like the most famous achievement of uh, partial differential equations in that decade. And the proof of Nash, which is really fascinating, is that it made a use of the Boltzmann entropy, uh, a concept from statistics, which you use in the problem of regularity. This looked crazy. This transmission of concepts from field to field also came with a physical transmission from human being to human being. It turned out that Nash had learned about the entropy from Leonard Carlson, who was there in Princeton, and Leonard Carlson had known about it from his compatriot, uh, Kahneman, and uh, Thorsten Kahneman, and Thorsten Kahneman had been the first mathematician to work on a mathematical theory of the Boltzmann equation. So from Kahneman to Carlson to Nash, you had here that concept going from field to field. And uh, 50 years after Nash, there was a big shock when Perelman used an entropy formula to prove the Quincare conjecture. It was crazy. A problem of topology solved by some very hard stuff about entropies and so on. Even more shocking maybe when uh, Voiculescu, then Voiculescu, uh, solved the problem about in uh, von Neumann algebras, classification of two one factors, nothing to do even with physics or with partial differential equations, and still entropy played a key role in there. More recently, entropy was the basis of defining heat equation, spaces which are not smooth at all, with maybe edges and so on, in metric measure spaces. The theory of Ambrosio, Gili, and Savare. This is part of a story in which I was involved and that I will tell in the end of this talk. Here, again, we see this particularity of mathematics among sciences is that it is abstract and so it touches on everything. A concept which has been developed in this context can be applied in many other contexts. Sometimes uh, this kind of go-between movement between various fields and concepts is very Low, slow, as we saw, but sometimes it's also very fast. And uh, sometimes mathematicians see applications in their lifetime or work directly for it. One of the best examples is Leonid Kantorovich. It was his 100th anniversary last year. Kantorovich was uh, an extraordinarily gifted mathematician working in very abstract subjects, but also very concrete problems of transport during the war, atomic bomb, also taxi fares. I was told this, if you ask people from Moscow of a certain age, they will tell you that at some point, taxi fares became much better, more just, efficient, and so on. This is because there was this team led by Kantorovich that had computed a good algorithm for that. He was very much fond of calculators and so on. He was a very courageous scientist uh, living in a time that was in Soviet Russia, in which you could very well be killed for just being a good scientist, if you just were working on the wrong subject. Kantorovich's master work was in mathematical economy, in particular the best uses of economic resources, his masterpiece for 1959. 
He was the first mathematician to get the Nobel Prize in economics for mathematical developments. Kantorovich was always a devout communist in nature and planification. He believed in the efficiency of central planification and worked for this. And one day there was a big event in his life all coming from plywood. This is plywood, like this. It's not very sexy, apparently. Plywood industry played the following major role in Kantorovich's life, that there was some, some factory of plywood that needed to increase and optimize its production. And they thought, maybe there are these mathematicians around that can help us. They go and meet in the department, the math department, and uh, uh, Kantorovich was quite young, but already the head of his department. And uh, they asked, you know, we are constructing this wood, and we take out wood from this forest. Forest, There is some hard wood, some soft wood. We have this machine that can, ca can cut that many uh, kilograms of hard wood a day, and so on. How do we optimize? You know, there are many ways to send the wood from here to there or there. Should we do more soft wood here, and then what to do? A problem of operational research, you see. And Kantorovich had no idea how to solve it, but he thought. And he came out with the technique of linear programming. Once again, to solve a concrete problem, go for an abstract solution. So Kantorovich is one of the three inventors of linear programming, together with Koopmans and Danzig. And linear programming is simply, simple to state. You have a domain which is delimited by linear constraints, like this, interior of a polygon. And you optimize a certain criterion, which is like uh, in a direction you want to know which point will be the furthest. And it's easy to solve graphically when it is like this. But when you do it with thousands of variables, sometimes hundreds of thousands of variables, as is the uh, case nowadays for some applications, of course you need a mathematical theory behind. Linear programming is one of the most successful algorithm theories ever invented. One of the things that Kantorovich discovered is that with his theory, he could solve in a practical way a problem that was set by Monge long ago, optimal transport. You have matter that you want to transport from sources to targets. Maybe this is where you produce a good and this is where you consume it. How do you make this allocation? Should you send the production from here to here? or to here, or to here, etc. Which is the optimal pairing, you know. And Kantorovich showed how you can rewrite this problem in terms of economics and prices. Like you will determine the selling price depending on the lo initial location, and the buying price depending on the final location. And uh, the problem of minimizing the transport cost minimizing how much it costs to transport the goods from start to end, turns out to be a problem of maximizing a difference of prices, like maximizing a profit. And from there follow algorithms and recipes and so on. See how dangerous this was. This was really dangerous. He was trying, and this was his dream, to construct a rational theory of price. In those days where prices were so much loaded with ideology, was uh, just risky life. But uh, that was his idea, that it was for Russia a matter of life or death to have set up a good system of prices so that the economy can work. This is the memoir of Monge. Notice the interesting page number, which is a clue from the beastly nature of the subject. And uh, nowadays, the Kantorovich theory, the linear programming, it is used in everything. See these examples taken from tutorial on the web, from big gambling club, media selection problem, to portfolio selection, to food production, to products mix, whatever. Many, many problems arising in industry. As soon as it is linear, then you will turn them into a linear programming problem and algorithms. All of them reduced to the same abstract formulation, and you can find many 
uh, tools to compute it automatically. Now, at this point, I have told you many stories. It's too many to make a good lecture, it seems. There was the story of uh, Riemann and his fat triangles, the story of uh, Boltzmann and his disorder or entropy, the story of Kantorovich and optimization problem. Yes, this is okay, mastering the technology. And uh, uh, it turns out that a completely unexpected way these theories, although they were made by different people with different tools for different applications, they have a deep relation. This is a discovery that was made around the year 2000 by a few people, including myself, and that was not expected neither by specialists of Kantorovich theory, nor by geometers, nor by people in statistical mechanics. And uh, it's good to use this to remind that science is not predictable, most of it. At least the unexpected discoveries, they will always occur and change the picture you have about it. One often thing that the job of the scientist is to ask a challenge, think hard, read deeply, think, and then find a good thing with maybe Nobel Prize or something coming from it. In reality, it's more like this. When there is a challenge, you work hard, it doesn't work at all, not going to be as expected, are you kidding me? Amazing result that turned out to be just crap. <laughs> and you start again, what the hell is going on? Well, it works, no it doesn't, yes maybe, mm, that's funny, no, and then you start again. <laughs> or maybe you say, oh, this makes sense, but then they figured this out 50 years ago. <laughs> about this. That's the cycle that, you know, PhD students are used to. And from time to time, something works. And after you solve it, you can go back to start. <laughs> so in this process, which is very chaotic, encounters, human encounters and discussion can play a key role. For me, these were the two key encounters in this uh, discovery. My German collaborator, Felix Otto, whom I met in a conference in 1998 in France and then went to visit him in Santa Barbara for a couple of weeks, and my uh, American collaborator, John Lott, whom I met in Berkeley in 2004. This is Berkeley. I'm going there soon. Beautiful campus, beautiful Californian weather, and uh, this famously ugly mathematical building. See, it is Evans Hall. It's known to be ugly. It's also completely, completely inconvenient. You never meet people because it's a uh, vertical organization, you know, there are no meeting points, no meeting rooms. It's a disaster. I had good conditions there. I was there as a Miller professor. Uh, no duties, no administration, no teaching, nothing. Just attending a lunch once a week and uh, prepare a speech for half an hour during one of these lunches, so once during the semester. For that, I was paid three times my French salary. And still, I was bored because nothing ever occurred in that building. Until John Lott arrived. He was, yes, I'm John Lott, I'm a geometer. I read what you worked with uh, Felix Otto about optimal transport and entropy. We're going to use it in applications to, to uh, geometry problems. Richie Curvature appears in the paper, it is much deeper, we can put the theory at the basis of Richie Curvature and so on. And so we worked. After this encounter, we worked for several years, mostly by email, and uh, after some time, uh, wrote a paper, a paper appeared in 2008 maybe, it was one of the most quoted papers in mathematics of the, that time. Just because you encounter the right person. The relation is summarized in this what I will call lazy gas experiment. It's one of the driving principles behind the big book that was Antonio mentioned, this thousand page book which I wrote on optimal transport. And uh, I will summarize it for you so 
this kind of relation grew from a work I did with Otto. Then there was a contribution by Cordero and Macken and Schmuckenschläger. And it was formalized by Lott and myself and by Karl Theo Sturm in Germany at about the same time with slightly complementary point of view. So here is a relation. You want to know if you are in positive curvature or not. And you start with a certain density of gas. And you prescribe a new density. Tell the gap maybe there is one minute to go from your stage, your current stage, to another stage. And you know, the gas does it, but it's a big change. It's like when you try to make reforms in a country or a continent. People will adapt, but uh, they want to do it at least effort. So the gas is lazy, and he will adapt to the new configuration by spending the least amount of work that the least amount of kinetic energy. And all during this process, you measure the entropy of the gas in the sense of Boltzmann, the disorder. And you prop that curve as a function of time. And if that curve is always concave, it means you are living in a world of positive curvature. <coughs> Sorry. Actually, in the sense of Ricci. It is very different from the classical interpretation of curvature. It be as follows, for instance, with uh, lines and geodesics. The current uh, common interpretation would be that negative curvature world is a world in which you always overestimate light sources. If this is the light source and this is you, because light rays are curved by the curvature of the space, then when you try to reconstruct the shape of the light source, you will be induced in error. And uh, if the surface of the source is always smaller than you think, then it means you are in a positive curvature space. That's the usual interpretation. Now, this is a completely different interpretation, but it's the same mathematical object of curvature behind. And you see here, in this experiment, the three stories that I told you are mixed. There is a curvature, and it appears in the way that trajectories of particles separate or converge. There is the entropy, and it appears in the way that you measure the concentration of the gas. And there is also the optimization of Antorovich, and it appears in the fact that the gas will produce the least amount of energy. And uh, there we are. I, we are back to what I was telling at the story. Sometimes progress comes from the merging or the encounter of several lines of research. And often it comes from encounter of human beings. From that, many consequences arise in a way. For instance, with this, we were able to solve a problem in geometry that seems to be a problem of pure geometry. They of spaces which have positive curvature. Does the limit has positive curvature too? Very simple question, purely geometric. But the answer relies on this kind of interpretation with probability densities and optimal transportation and so on. And uh, I end up by mentioning that this is the purpose and primary goal of an institute like the one that I am directing, like other institutes of mathematics around the world in many countries, to make uh, researchers meet and discuss. And you don't know, you cannot predict what they will discover. But just the meeting in good conditions will for sure entail new discoveries. Thank you.